So I'm Marcus. Uh, I'm working with Object Box for the last uh, couple of years. And with Object Box, my, uh, my tasks shifted a little bit. So I've been a Java developer for 20 years, an Android developer for 10, uh, 10 years. But with Object Box, I use C++ a lot. And actually, I liked it. So here's the story. I want to start with web technology. So web technology is all around. And it's, it's really like, for example, if you uh, start Slack, this is like a web technology, right? It might take a little until the messages are loaded. And also, if you look at the processes, it is eating a lot of resources. So if you compare that, so today, they're using like one gigabyte of RAM. And if you look like 50 years back, four kilobyte were enough to fly to the moon. So it was just a little bit about resourcefulness. And if you look at uh, cross-platform approaches, I know you, you saw it was like 10 times in this conference already, so we have web, progressive web apps, we had PhoneGap, Electron, which powered Slack and others, um, React Native, Java and Kotlin. So, so Kotlin is, is really an interesting option, as we saw in several uh, presentations already. Also might be Swift. Uh, so there might be some, I don't know, fighting between iOS world and Android world. But this, this could really make sense. But where's another option? And this is like going to the real uh, metal here. And this is like C and C++. So basically, C is like like in uh, a sampler for multi-platform. And it's been around forever, and this is nothing new. So C developers are used to develop multi-platform. So when does it make sense to actually use C or C++? Usually, it's about performance. So even with Kotlin native, they will, they will take years to get to the speed that you already have with C++. It's so optimized. I'm, I'm so impressed what uh, C++ compilers do. It's just amazing what, what, what complex code they take and how fast like, the result is. And especially on Android. Because when you look at Android, it's uh, running a virtual machine. And it's not like a Java virtual machine running on desktop. It's, it's several times slower than that. And of course, there are some other reasons why you could use C or C++. It might be a little bit a uh, uh, background of your company that you use C or C++ somewhere, and you could just use that code. So where do you want to use it? If you use a game, that's, that's just great. You could use uh, like Unity or uh, like, like Unreal, and with uh, like, for example, Unreal, the game engine, you would uh, use C++. But for, like, typical apps, it's not so good choice. Because you still want the system-specific look and feel in your app as well. Also, if you interact a lot with your uh, operating system, there are better options. Because, uh, if, like, all the Java APIs you have for Android they are not available in C++. So what makes more sense is when you have a special use case. Like, for example, you want to implement some specific cryptography. And you could also add some, some business logic around it. Because when you, use, when, you, when you have a need for high performance anyway, you could just go ahead and extend this a little, because it will run on all platforms. So, and there's also WebAssembly. Who has heard of WebAssembly? I want to see some hands. OK, not so many. So this is, WebAssembly is about running native code in your web browser. And all major browsers support it already. So there's a tool chain that you can use for, for your C uh, or C++ code. And of course, it's like a secure sandbox in theory. Um, and there's a lot of interoperability with JavaScript. And also, you have functionality to all 
your browser's functionality. And it comes with, like, like it started with C, C++ support, and this is still the best support you can have for WebAssembly. So, so this is another platform you can focus with uh, C++, actually. And I, I, and I didn't even talk about IoT, small devices, and so on. So C and C++ are really multi-platform. OK. Before I go on, I want to take a little uh, step back and talk about some fundamentals about more close to the hardware things. And yeah, so, so if you look what's going on, like a CPU only understands machine code. These are just like bytes in a specific order. And if you want to, um, if, if you want to write code for it, you need a compiler or interpreter. And also, like, if you look at the CPU, there are registers. And both registers are very important because they are very fast to access. And also, like most operations you can do in data is, is done within both registers. And if you look at memory, it's like a chunk of memory you have. And every, um, like, like every byte has its address. This is just a number. So let's see if you have a class like this. Very su super simple class, name counter, versus constructor, whatever, and there's the increase method. So if you would use that, you would have like an object. It has its state, like for example, box is the name, and currently there are no box, so count is zero. And you call it, and it increases to one. So this is your object. Now, how does this look in like, like memory? So this is like a little simplified, but you can see um, like name box has uh, some strange content. And here, count maps to this one. So well, maybe a couple of questions here. So why, why is that the one in the first byte? So it was like the uh, little endian thing. So, so the byte ordering also comes into play at some times when you work low level. And this is actually like a pointer. So it doesn't contain box, like the uh, four letters. But it's, it's more of a, it's pointing somewhere. Where does it point to? To another memory address. And here you can see, like, this, is like, this looks like ASCII code, but where's the zero in it? That's because you have UTF-16. Uh, so Java stores uh, those with, with uh, like, like each character in two bytes. And this is how it resolves to a real string. So, in, and if you look at some code that you execute, like in your in your um, object-oriented world, everything is the same, like data and and methods and so on. From from hardware perspective, it's pretty different. So you have your code and you have your data. And with like with simple count plus plus just translates to uh, a couple of like low-level uh, calls, which is like, oops, sorry, wrong button. So this is like the address here. So what, what is happening, we are loading the content of this address into register A. And then we can add one to register A, and then we can store it. And at that point, and only at that point, like the data gets updated. And this is also like part of the explanation why, why a plus plus is not atomic. Because even here, it's like free uh, operations. And there's a very interesting website. It's, it's the, like the Compiler Explorer. And you can paste in C or C++ code. And it will give you a sample code. So you can really look under the hood of what's going on in, in compilers. So why did I tell you this? The point are pointers. A pointer is just, just a variable pointing to some um, memory, 
to some memory address. And there's also a lot with pointer arithmetic uh, done in, in C, C++. For example, you have a pointer to an object, and if you get some data from this object, like a property, it's, it's just like a base address and adding some offset to it. And it's also like the safest way to get into trouble. So if something goes wrong, it's usually a bad pointer that you have in your uh, program. And this is like where, it's, where it can get really nasty. So if you, if you are troubled with null pointer exception, this is way worse than that. And if you look at how you deal with actual C++ objects, it, for, for example, if we create a new person, and by the way, C++ has this great auto, so we don't even know the type right now. Um, so it's a pointer. So if you create a new object, it's a pointer. So where is no garbage collection, no auto-release pool, or whatever. So once we have the object, how, how can we delete it? And this is also like a call that you have to do on your, uh, by yourself, right? And there's another problematic scenario. So for example, you call a method. Maybe you didn't write it. And you get a pointer to person back. So you, you don't know, should I delete this pointer? Or is it like an internal pointer uh, managed somewhere else? And, and these are like the typical problems of C++. And it gets, it gets a little worse when you have like, a, uh, like an object. And it's referenced by multiple other objects. So in the end, who's the owner of, of Joe? <laughs> and who will delete Joe after everybody's finished? And which is where modern C++ kicks in. So with C++ 11, where there have been so big steps ahead, for example, smart pointers. What you can do here is you can, for example, you can return a unique pointer from your method. And in this way, you transfer the ownership to the caller of this, me uh, of this method. And when you call this method again and assign another person to it, like a smart pointer automatically deallocates, deletes the first person. And if uh, like this unique pointer gets out of scope, also the second person is deleted. And this is just one of the things you can do. There's also like shared pointer. And this is exactly like the situation where you had with, with Joe and multiple references to it. And this, is, this pretty much works like reference counting. And once like nobody references like a person anymore, it, it is getting deleted automatically. So this fixes most of the bad, bad problems uh, we all think C++ is about. Who knows what that is? Ray. OK, so. It's a funny acronym. And yeah, I better skip it and just explain by an example. So for example, you have this lock guard. So this is like an object on the stack. So once the method returns, this object um, gets deallocated. And what happens here is you're, you're getting like a lock on a mutex, and then also file. So both use uh, this Ray principle. And once they are deleted, the resources are freed. So you don't have to call like file close or lock unlock. It's done automatically and in the right order. So that's the reverse order of, of creation. So in, even if here um, an exception might be thrown, it is, everything is nicely um, deallocated, and there's, there's no like if, else, error, whatever, uh, things you have to do manually. And this, this gets your code much cleaner. 
and C++11 also comes with lambdas. So we had function pointers before, but this is just much more nicer. You can capture variables, and also it can be templated. So you don't even lose performance. It's just like you wrote like, uh, like a method 10 times for, for different types. So compilers are really smart about this. There's also like the standard template library, and with C++11, it got a lot of useful additions. So for example, threads. It's very simple to create a thread and uh, yeah, wait for a thread. We, we already saw the locking. And also, it supports atomic, atomic values, atomic types. So you can do like the counter plus plus in an atomic way, very simple. And it also has, just like Java, Kotlin, whatever, it also has some nice containers, like the methods uh, are a little strange, like push back instead of add, but in the end, it's, it's pretty much the same functionality. And if you look, at, for example, you have a vector of users, how you iterate over your users, it looks pretty much like Java, right? Just one line before each, and, and you're done. OK, now let's look at how you can integrate C++ with, with Java, for example. So where's Java native interface? And it allows you to call from Java into native C. And there's also an API that allows you to call uh, into like the Java world from C. So it's like a two-way uh, two bridge. So there's a funny uh, signature that you have to um, adhere to, to, to implement your methods. And it, there's also some tools around it, but usually you can, you can also just, once you know how, uh, how the pattern is, you can just uh, type it or copy paste it on your own. So like one thing is, how do I pass, for example, a C++ object to uh, Java? That's pretty hard, but at some point you need references. For, for example, like in your second uh, JNI call, you want to reference this uh, C++ object, so you can still pass like a long, and with you can cast. And yeah. So we, we, we have those C-style methods. And there's also like this uh, JNI env object. So you can do everything with that. Whatever you do, if you create a string, you want to read a uh, int property, you have to use JNI env. And there's some conversion going on. When you call into like your native method, then there's, there's a, a corresponding C-type, for example, jint j string or uh, j object, and that's like valid for all classes you, you could possibly have. So let's look how this works. So with, for, for example, you have some um, string passed from Java. So you, you can get like the C string using the env, but let's make this a little more modern, and, and you could come up with, a, with some helper classes using Ray again. And what you would do, okay, that's a release. Yeah, so for, for, I forgot about that. So with environment, JNI env, you always have to release your resources. So this is pretty much C style. So to wrap this, you can come up with a Ray class for, for example, JNI string. And in a constructor, you just um, get the C uh, characters. And in the destructor, you clean up. And there's one additional thing. There is operator overloading. So whenever you use this J, uh, JNI string, as, and, but you want to have like a char pointer, that's, that's how you can very simply uh, call this uh, overloaded operator. So maybe it becomes more clear if you look at an example. So where's this method called foo that you want to call? It, is, it has a C-style 
signature with const jar pointer. And where's this JNI method you, you implement? So you get like the environment in and uh, uh, like a J string. So all what you have to do is you would allocate the JNI string, your helper class, and call foo using this. And there's no, no cleanup, so this is, this is a way, way cleaner way of doing this. So JNI, yeah, it's old. It has its challenges. So f first of all, there's, there's no good interface to, to get the data of your uh, Java objects. It's, it works pretty much like reflection. So using its name, you can uh, get properties. And that's not obviously not the most efficient way. But also when you call into JNI native, you, you have some overhead. There are some security checks and so on. So that what, also influences the way you design your JNI API. And there's this uh, fun topic of also like freeing your resources. In, in Java, you don't have any guarantees for your garbage collector. So when, when an object dies, it can be now, it can be in five minutes, whatever. And, and this, this is like a little mismatch with, with the native code if like your Java object has like references to native resources. So you can, what, what you probably do is if you have like a close method or something that you call manually. And just to be sure, also have something like a finalizer or reference queue. And also, um, if you're using like, like more modern C++ code, you want to use exceptions. And there's just one catch with that, or there isn't a catch with that. Um, it will kill your Java process. So what you do is you catch a C++ exception and raise a Java exception. And, and where is the difference between throwing and raising an exception? If you raise an exception, it's just, just one, of, one of the few method calls you make with jnienv. And it, re it returns regularly, so you have to take care that your flow also like, returns from the jni method. Like maybe if there's a return type of uh, j object, you just return null pointer or something. OK, there's some fun stuff you can also have with JNI. So for example, we have a st static native method. And like a non-static method calling the static one. And you just call fr from the object the Java method. And what could possibly go wrong, right? Looks good, right? What could happen is that um, like the native foo function has an illegal object. Like, like the object it is called on with bar is already gone. So this is just some things uh, what you happen to run into. So the solution is very simple. You just have to kick the static and you're, you're good again. But yeah, you, you still notice you still have a reference because that object is still here. Anyway, so JNI is, is not the greatest interface in the world, but it's like the only one uh, if, you, if you want to talk to C. Fortunately, there are some more convenient alternatives around, like this uh, JNI. It's pretty dynamic. It looks up your library at runtime, and it does all the like, type conversions for you, or like the most simple ones. And also Genie by Dropbox, which works a little differently. So what happens here is you define a text file, an IDL, and it generates some, uh, some artifacts for several platforms. So, so for C++, Java, and Objective-C. And this, this makes it also much easier. So when we look at Android, it's quite easy to get started. What you have to install is like a CMake, NDK, and with the NDK, you get Java native interface, unfortunately. 
um, a pretty good compiler, so Clang, and GCC will be not supported anymore. It was like the default compiler like a couple of years ago, but we switched to Clang internally. And with Clang, or also GCC, cross-compiles your C++ uh, code in for all the CPUs that are around. And, and like Clang 6 is pretty new, so it also supports like newer standards like C++ uh, 17. So from, from the NDK, you can also use specific Android APIs. It's not that you can use the entire Android operating system, but some APIs are available. So if, you, if you're targeting like a lower API level, you're pretty much restricted, whereas logging and some other stuff. And some, some cooler stuff comes with Android 8 uh, and 8.1, like neural networks, shared memory. All right, so where's also CMake? So when you use Gradle for your um, Android build, you would use CMake for your C++ build. It is, it is like a yeah, high, more high-level make for, for and cross-platform that internally uses make or Ninja as, uh, to make to compile. And what you do, you specify like a text file. It has a specific syntax. You will see a short example shortly. So how do you integrate CMake into your Android build? That's pretty simple. So it's just, you basically just point it. Here's your CMake file, and that's it. You can also give in some configuration. So for example, um, you want to have some flavors you can pass, pass in. Uh, also different configurations into your C++ build. Another challenge is like if you have a lot of data and you want to share that in both of worlds. So what is very easy, for example, if, if it's like byte-based, so for example, image data or you do some cryptography, so you usually have like big byte buffers and those go just, just well back and forth. When you have uh, like objects, like like both ways are not so so great, because yeah, like a J object is very you, you like like this this uh, reflection style access and so on, and the same way is just not so good. So how could you solve that? You could have use some um, JSON for interop, but there's another like better alternative when you use, for example, something like uh, protocol buffers, flag buffers. So you are uh, you, you're, you still have those bytes uh, to to call into your uh, different platforms, kind of. And but actually, those bytes are objects. So this, this is a pretty good workaround. Or of course, you could use a database that works on both ends. So. When you start with a new project and want to use the NDK, there's also a template given from Android Studio. So all you have to do is a little checkbox, include C++ support, and here we go. It gives you an activity, already uh, calls like system load library, and also has like a first native uh, step for, for, for your C uh, style method. And also the first template for a C++ file, where are some includes, obviously. And, and here's this uh, funny naming. So it goes like Java, then the package all with underscore, and then there's the class. And here, finally, is your method. So this is just a convention to map with C method to your Java native method. And there's some other stuff around it. So, so it's really getting exported with this method uh, for, from your library and it's accessible. So you need to have some, write some yada yada about that also. And yeah, here's another example. This is how you can return like Java objects from your native code. So again, it's 
going uh, with the JNI environment. And yeah, for example, new string. So if you look at the uh, CMake file that is generated, it's, it's very simple. So you can ignore most of it. But those, those two lines are enough for a CMake file. So for some reason, you have to specify a minimum version for CMake. And then you just say there's a library, and it has the source file. And you're done. OK, so some more stuff. So we, we, I talked about uh, C++ 11. And yeah, so where's, meanwhile, where's like C++ 14? It was like more a small release, but 17 is a pretty important release again. And it has some cool features that you might know of, uh, for example, Kotlin with decomposition. So this is an example here. So in the end, you will have like three variables with different types. And so you write a lot, of, a lot less code again. And also, like the standard template library got important upgrades. So pretty, pretty nice stuff with optional any and uh, string view. And surprisingly, it, it took very long to have a file system for C++ that works cross-platform now. So before that, like, like even like reading all files within a directory that was platform dependent code and with C17 it's not. Okay, so we talked about Android and C in general. And if you look at the iOS side of things, it's actually much nicer here. So there's no J and I. But your Objective C plus plus code can just use C code. And that makes it very, very simple. However, if you also want to support Swift, uh, there's no direct access way here. So what you would do is uh, Swift calling into some Objective C. And it can't be Objective C at this point. So anything that looks like C would confuse the Swift part. So you, what you uh, usually do is you have some Objective C protocol only for your Objective C++ class. So, so you're mostly Android developers. Uh, key takeaway is way, way simpler on iOS. So testing is very important with uh, C++. And the nice thing is, because C++ just runs on your, also like your desktop machine, you can also run tests that run uh, directly. So you don't have to upload it to your device or anything. You can just run it. There are like a couple of testing frameworks. So unit testing, um, yeah. So I kind of like catch two a lot. With Google Test, you have to install an environment in the first place. And catch2, for example, is just a header file that you include. And the nice part here is we're so fast. So you can have like hundreds of uh, uh, unit tests, and they just run like in a second. There's also one more thing you should consider. Whereas those sanitizers, like address sanitizer or ASAN, and those check that you don't have bad pointers, bad memory access. And this helps a lot before it gets really ugly. So when, when you have bad pointers somewhere in your code, you, you can be busy for days. So we, these are really the tools you can use and, and combined with a CI, it really keeps your uh, productivity level up. So you need a little safety net with C++, but once you have that in place, like, like personally, I feel as productive as, with C++ as I do in Java. And these are my closing words. Thank you. <laughs> so. Wow, we have time for questions. I'm not sure. Oh, wow, there is one. Well, great, a, a couple. 
Uh, of course, I thought it wasn't that easy, right? But please come and I'll give you the mic. Uh, thanks for the presentation, very interesting. Uh, I was wondering how easy to, to have Android, C++, and iOS, and in theory, other platforms in a single project. I know that it should be possible to abstract the, the bridge between C and Java, or C and Objective-C, or other things, but how much work is it on uh, doing all of those bridges? All those bridges. Um, so for JNI part, it is uh, a little bit more work because there is uh, some conversion going on, and it really depends on on your project. So if you have if you're doing a lot in C++, have just a few methods that's like done in minutes. Um, and on like the iOS side, it's it's very simpler because you can access C++ directly. So there's no strange uh, Java native interface here. So with, I, like the bridge part is, I don't know, it's like maybe like 10% of the work. And that's just because of JNI. Any other questions? Okay. You after that. Um, what are the key facts for you when do you, would you recommend to use C++ for shared code or other technologies like or languages like Kotlin or JavaScript or whatever? Um, good question. So um, usually you have a reason to use C++ because you want some great performance or you have some code that is close to, to some hardware you use or your company has some C++ code or you just, uh, or whatever. Maybe you have good C++ developers. Um, so with, these are all reasons and yeah, I think Kotlin native, for example, still has to catch up a lot. In the long run, I think that's a very interesting uh, road, but it's, it's not as stable, not as proven, whatever, as, as C++. Hello, uh, I have a question. Maybe uh, could you give me a practical advice? I have a problem, I should... Uh, uh, pass an interface to my C++ core, and this interfa interface will be implemented in Java, and I should uh, call it maybe 10 times per second and pass a lot of data. Uh, maybe you could advise me how maybe most efficient way uh, from performance point of view, how could we implement it? <laughs> okay, so so great question. and. Answer might be a little more complex. Maybe you should talk. So basically, you would you would supply uh, the native side of things with, like for example, a method name, and using this uh, JNI env, you can call into Java. Um, but let's discuss this in more detail, like privately. <laughs> 